Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Welcome back to our journey through the annals of history, where the sands of Egypt whisper tales of power, passion, and politics. As we open Chapter 6, the shadow of war looms large over Alexandria. Cleopatra and Caesar, entwined by fate and ambition, prepare to face the brewing storm together. Amidst the backdrop of a city bracing for siege, alliances are tested and strategies are drawn. In this chapter, we delve deeper into the heart of Cleopatra's reign, exploring the complexities of her relationship with Rome and her fight to secure her throne and legacy. Join us as we continue to uncover the story of Cleopatra, a queen, a lover, and a leader whose brilliance and determination shaped the course of history. Cleopatra Chapter 6 Gorgeous Princess in the Presence of Caesar, the Son of Egypt Meanwhile, while the events mentioned in the previous chapter were happening in Alexandria, Cleopatra felt worried and unsure in her camp. She was uncertain about the best course of action. She wanted to be in Alexandria because she was aware that Caesar had complete control over the situation in Egypt. She really wanted to present her case to him. But Ptolemy and Pothinus were talking to the judge, and she didn't even know if they were trying to get on his good side. Meanwhile, she was far away, and no one knew about her situation, or even if she still existed. Of course, in this situation, she really wanted to go to Alexandria. But she was very confused about how to do that. She couldn't lead an army there because the king's army was at Pelusium and blocking the way. She couldn't go alone or with a few people because Pothinus had garrisons and officers in every town and village. And they would definitely stop her. She didn't have any ships, so she couldn't travel by sea. If she managed to get to the gates of Alexandria, she would still face the challenge of safely making her way to Caesar's palace. The city, with the exception of Caesar's controlled area, was under the control of Pothinus's government. The challenges she faced in achieving her goal seemed almost impossible to overcome. Cleopatra was determined to try. She messaged Caesar, asking if she could appear before him and defend herself. Caesar agreed and encouraged her to come. She traveled by boat with only a few attendants along the coast to Alexandria. Her main supporter on this risky journey was a servant named Apollodorus. She also had some other attendants with her. When they arrived in Alexandria, they waited until night and then approached the base of the citadel walls. Here, Apollodorus wrapped the queen in a piece of carpet and covered it with a cloth to make it look like a regular bundle of goods. Then he carried the load on his shoulder and went into the city. Cleopatra was around 21 years old at that time, but she had a slim and graceful figure, so the burden was not too heavy for him. Apollodorus arrived at the palace gates where Caesar was staying. The guards asked him what he was carrying. He said it was a gift for Caesar. So they allowed him to pass, and the pretended porter carried his package safely in. When it was unrolled and Cleopatra came out to view, Caesar was perfectly charmed with the spectacle. In such situations, she experienced a range of conflicting emotions that she couldn't suppress. These emotions added a dual layer of intrigue to her already pretty and expressive face, as well as to her naturally captivating manners. She was excited by the adventure through which she had passed, and yet pleased with her narrow escape from its dangers. She felt a strong curiosity and interest in the important figure she had been unexpectedly brought before. However, this was tempered by a sense of timidity, common in new and unexpected situations like this, especially when aware of being keenly observed by men. This mix of emotions is a natural part of a woman's experience in such circumstances. 
the conversation between Caesar and Cleopatra made a strong impression on him. Cleopatra's intelligence, liveliness, unique ideas, and way of expressing them made her a very entertaining and pleasant companion, in addition to her personal charms. In fact, she completely captured the heart of the great conqueror. Because of his strong attachment to her, Caesar became unable to act impartially in the dispute between Cleopatra and her brother over their rights to the crown. We often refer to Ptolemy as Cleopatra's brother, despite him being her husband, because their marriage was probably more of a formality. This is especially plausible considering Ptolemy was only 10 or 12 years old at the time Cleopatra was expelled from Alexandria. Caesar, who was around 52 years old at the time, had a wife named Calpurnia. They had been married for about 10 years. Calpurnia was living quietly in Rome at that time. She was a kind and gentle woman who loved her husband deeply. She was patient and understanding of his flaws, but also worried and unhappy about the challenges and risks that his ambitious nature often brought. Caesar quickly developed a strong interest in supporting Cleopatra's cause. He showed her great affection, and she naturally began to return his kindness. For Cleopatra, having a sincere and dedicated friend who sought to protect and make her happy was a new and welcome experience. Her father had always neglected her, and her younger, less mature brother, whom she was forced to marry, had turned into her worst enemy. Although he was just a pawn used by others to strip her of her inheritance and exile her, this didn't make her view him any more favorably. Instead, it made him seem both detestable and pitiful in her eyes. Even the government officials in the Alexandrian court had turned against her. They believed they could exert greater control over her brother in her absence. Thus, she had always been surrounded by selfish, greedy, and relentless enemies. Now, for the first time, she seemed to have a friend. Suddenly, she found a protector willing to support and defend her. This man was not only attractive in appearance and behavior, but he also possessed a noble and generous nature, coupled with a high social standing. He loved her, and she could not refrain from loving him in return. She entrusted her case entirely to him, shared all her interests with him, and surrendered herself completely to his control. Her complete trust in him was not unwarranted, especially when it came to his attempts to bring her back to power. Caesar's legions from Syria had not yet arrived, so his position in Alexandria was weak and uncertain. Nevertheless, he maintained his confident and determined demeanor, wasting no time in working toward Cleopatra's reinstatement. Caesar's bold claim to decide the ruler in a country where he had arrived by chance amidst a power struggle for the throne highlighted the extent of Roman authority at that time. His assertion, made without any actual means to enforce it, reflected how much power and respect the Roman Empire commanded in the eyes of people around the world. It also reveals Caesar's unique qualities and personality. Shortly after Cleopatra arrived, Caesar summoned the young Ptolemy and advised him to bring Cleopatra back. Ptolemy, who was old enough to have his own thoughts, strongly disagreed with this idea. During their conversation, Ptolemy discovered that Cleopatra was in Alexandria, hiding in Caesar's palace. This knowledge made him very angry and upset. He left Caesar's presence in a rage. He took off the crown that he usually wore in public, threw it on the ground, and stomped on it. He told the people that he had been betrayed and showed signs of extreme frustration and disappointment. In his efforts to incite public anger against Caesar and the Romans, he centered his complaint on his sister's actions. He emphasized the impropriety of her surrendering herself to Caesar, using this as a key point to provoke outrage. It's quite possible that his jealousy and anger stemmed from something other than just his sister's actions. Considering he likely shared traits with other Ptolemies in his family, his real concern was probably Cleopatra gaining significant influence and power. This fear would be heightened by her alliance with such a distinguished protector. However, Ptolemy, along with Pothinus, Achilles, and all his other friends and supporters, 
managed to create a widespread and intense uproar in the city. The people were stirred up, gathering in large, angry crowds, filled with indignation. Some people understood the reasons for their anger and acted accordingly. Some individuals were aware that the motive behind the sudden outbreak was to target the Romans. They were ready to engage in any violent acts against these foreign intruders. Their willingness to act was present regardless of having a specific reason or not. Many others, most of whom lacked any real understanding of the situation, knew only that chaos and commotion would ensue in and around the palaces. They were drawn to the scene, wanting to be part of the action. Ptolemy and his officers did not have a big group of soldiers in Alexandria. The events that had happened since Caesar arrived had happened very quickly, so not much time had passed yet. The main army was still in Pelusium. The main group that attacked Caesar was the city's population, led by the king's guards. Caesar had only a small portion of his forces at the palace during the attack. The rest of his forces were spread throughout the city. Despite this, Caesar did not feel worried and did not limit himself to defensive actions. He sent a group of his soldiers to capture Ptolemy and bring him back as a prisoner. The soldiers, trained and disciplined like skilled Roman fighters, were full of excitement and energy. This kind of spirit often happens in troops led by Caesar himself. With these advantages, they could achieve almost any mission, even against a large and enraged civilian population. The soldiers went out, captured Ptolemy, and brought him back. The people were initially shocked by the boldness of this action and then angered by the disrespect of it, seen as an attack on their ruler. The uproar would have grown even louder, but Caesar, who had achieved his goals of capturing both Cleopatra and Ptolemy, decided it was best to calm things down. He went up to a high window in his palace where the angry crowd couldn't reach him and started signaling that he wanted to talk to them. When there was quiet, he gave them a speech that was meant to calm them down. He explained that he wasn't asserting his authority to choose between Cleopatra and Ptolemy as their superior. Instead, his role was to fulfill the responsibility entrusted to him by Ptolemy Olet, their father. This duty involved representing the interests of the Roman people. Besides this, he stated that he had no authority in the matter. His only goal in fulfilling his duty to review the case was to resolve the issue fairly and reasonably for all involved parties. This was to prevent the civil war from escalating and causing severe damage to the country. He advised them to leave and stop causing trouble in the city. He promised to resolve the issue between Cleopatra and Ptolemy and believed that everyone would be happy with his decision. This speech, given with eloquence and persuasion in a dignified and imposing manner that Caesar's speeches to unruly crowds were known for, had a significant impact. Some people were convinced, while others were silenced. Those who remained resentful and angry found themselves powerless due to the pacification of the majority. The angry crowd was broken up, and Ptolemy stayed with Cleopatra under Caesar's guard. The next day, Caesar fulfilled his promise and convened a meeting with influential individuals from Alexandria and government officials. He introduced Ptolemy and Cleopatra in an effort to resolve their conflict. The original testament created by Ptolemy Olet had been stored in the public records of Alexandria and was well preserved. A verified copy of the testament had also been sent to Rome. Caesar had the original testament brought out and read to the assembly. The provisions were very clear. It stated that Cleopatra and Ptolemy should get married and have joint power as king and queen. The document recognized the Roman Commonwealth as an ally of Egypt. It designated the Roman government to be the executor of the testament and the guardian of both the king and queen. This document was very clear and explicit. Just by reading it, it seemed to answer the question. Caesar proclaimed that Cleopatra should hold equal power to Ptolemy. As the Roman representative and executor of the testament, he stated it was his duty to safeguard the rights of both the king and the queen. It was difficult to argue against his decision. In addition to Cleopatra and Ptolemy, 
there were two more children of Ptolemy Aulettes in the royal family during this time. One was a girl named Arsinoe. The other was a boy who interestingly had the same name as his brother, Ptolemy. The children in question were quite young. However, Caesar believed that granting them a royal territory might win favor with the Alexandrians and increase the likelihood of them accepting his decision. He suggested assigning the island of Cyprus to them. This was actually a gift because Cyprus was under Roman control at that time. Everyone seemed happy with this decision except Pothinus. He had always been a strong and long-standing enemy of Cleopatra, and he knew that her reinstatement would lead to his downfall and ruin. He left the meeting feeling upset and decided that he wouldn't agree with the decision. Instead, he would take action right away to stop it from happening. Caesar organized a series of events and parties to celebrate and confirm the restoration of a good relationship between the king and queen and the resulting end of the war. He thought that having big celebrations would help remove any bad feelings that people still had. He hoped these events would make everyone in the city feel kinder and more friendly towards each other. The people agreed with these measures and actively worked to make them happen. However, Pothinus and Achilles secretly tried to organize a group and make plans to remove Caesar's influence and make Ptolemy the sole ruler again. Pothinus told everyone who would listen to him that Caesar's true intention was to make Cleopatra the sole queen and remove Ptolemy from power. He urged them to join forces with him to oppose this plan, as it would result in Egypt being ruled by a woman. He also devised a scheme with Achilles to recall the army from Pelusium. The army had 30,000 men. The conspirators thought that if they could get this army to Alexandria and keep it under Pothinus's command, they would gain a significant advantage. With this army, they believed they could overpower Caesar and his 3,000 Roman soldiers. However, there was a risk in ordering the army to march towards the capital. Ptolemy, under Caesar's influence, might communicate with the officers and take command of the army, thus sabotaging the conspirators' plans. To avoid this, it was agreed that Achilles would leave Alexandria, go to the camp at Pelusium, take command of the troops there, and lead them to the capital. He would only follow orders from Pothinus during these actions and after his arrival. Even though there were probably guards at the gates and roads out of the city, Achilles managed to escape and join the army. He led the troops and started marching towards the capital. Pothinus stayed in the city as a spy, pretending to agree with Caesar's decision and be friendly with him. But secretly, he was planning to overthrow Caesar and gathering information to help the army and Achilles when they arrived. All these things were done in secret, and the conspirators were very clever in planning and carrying out their plots. Caesar seemed to not know about what his enemies were doing until he heard that Ptolemy's army, with at least 20,000 soldiers, was approaching the city. Meanwhile, the forces he had requested from Syria had not yet arrived. With limited resources, he had no choice but to protect the capital and himself as best as possible. He decided to test the impact of orders sent in Ptolemy's name to prevent the army from approaching the city. Two officers were given these orders and sent to deliver them to Achilles. The officers' names were Dioscorides and Serapion. It is evident from the situation that in ancient times, the authority and importance of a king were highly regarded. This is exemplified by Achilles, who, upon the arrival of these men with a clear command from Ptolemy, chose to immediately kill them instead of hearing their message. This decision was likely made to avoid the responsibility of disobeying the orders. He knew that if he could successfully capture Alexandria, oust Caesar and Cleopatra, and restore Ptolemy as the sole ruler, the king would likely be satisfied with the result. In such a scenario, any past misconduct on his part might be overlooked, provided he didn't openly defy a direct order. Regardless of the nature of the commands brought by these messengers, he believed that they were likely given under the authority of Caesar and not by Ptolemy's own choice. 
In cases where commands came in Ptolemy's name, there was a common practice among officers serving under ancient military rulers. They often chose to eliminate the messengers rather than receive the command, as this avoided the direct risk of disobeying a royal order. Achilles then ordered the officers to be captured and killed. The soldiers followed orders and stabbed them, and then the bodies were taken away. However, it was discovered that the soldiers had not completed their tasks properly. They weren't interested in the cold-blooded assassination, and maybe they felt a sense of compassion that stopped them from doing it. In the end, even though both men were badly hurt, only one of them died. The other lived and recovered. Achilles kept moving towards the city. Caesar, realizing that the situation was becoming very serious, took command of the capital and started making necessary arrangements to defend himself there. His numbers were too small to defend the entire city against the large force that was coming to attack it. So he put his troops in the palaces, citadel, and other parts of the city that could be defended. He blocked off all the streets and roads to these places and strengthened the gates. And while he did his best to use the limited means of defense he had, he also made efforts to get help from outside. He dispatched ships to various locations accessible from Alexandria, such as Syria, Cyprus, and Rhodes, where Roman soldiers might be stationed. His goal was to request the authorities in these places to swiftly send additional troops to his aid. During this time, Cleopatra and Ptolemy stayed in the palace with Caesar, supposedly working together with him to defend the city from Achilles. Cleopatra genuinely cooperated, but Ptolemy's support was not very reliable. Although he had to pretend to be on Caesar's side due to his position, he probably secretly wanted Achilles to succeed and overthrow Caesar's plans. Pothinus was more actively hostile towards them, although he was still cautious. He secretly communicated with Achilles, occasionally sharing information about events and defense preparations within the city, as well as giving him instructions on what to do. He was very cautious and wise in all these actions, pretending all the time to be on Caesar's side. He acted as if he was very actively helping Caesar to better secure the different areas where attacks were anticipated, and in finalizing and completing the plans for defense. However, Despite his cunning, he was caught in his deceitful actions, and his career abruptly ended before the major conflict occurred. There was a barber in Caesar's household who, for some reason, started to suspect Pothinus. With not much else to do, the barber spent his time observing the eunuch's actions and informing Caesar about them. Caesar told the barber to keep watching. He did and soon his suspicions were confirmed when they intercepted a letter that Pothinus had written to Achilles, which was then brought to Caesar. This provided the required evidence of what they referred to as his guilt, and Caesar commanded for him to be executed by beheading. This event naturally caused a significant commotion within the palace, as Pothinus had been the dominant minister of state for many years, essentially acting as the king. His execution also caused fear among many others, who, although under Caesar's control, secretly hoped that Achilles would succeed. One person who was very worried about these fears was Ganymede. He was the officer in charge of Arsinoe, Cleopatra's sister. Caesar's plan to establish Cleopatra as co-ruler with her brother Ptolemy over Cyprus did not happen. After Caesar made his decision, everyone's focus shifted to the news of the approaching army and the preparations needed for the upcoming battle. Arsinoe stayed in the palace with her governor, Ganymede. Ganymede had joined Pothinus in his plots. When Pothinus was beheaded, Ganymede decided it would be safest for him to flee. He decided to escape from the city with Arsinoe. It was a dangerous attempt, but he managed to do it. Arsinoe was eager to go, as she was old enough to feel the strong desire for power that seemed to be a common trait in every member of the Ptolemaic family. She was insignificant and powerless in her previous position, but at the forefront of the army, she could immediately transform into a queen. This unfolded exactly as she had anticipated. Achilles and his troops greeted her with cheers. Under Ganymede's guidance, a decision was made regarding the royal succession. 
they noted that the rest of the royal family was held captive by a foreign general who had taken control of the capital unexpectedly. This situation left the royals unable to wield their power. As a result, they resolved that Arsinoe should assume the crown. Consequently, they declared her as the queen. Everything was now ready for a fierce battle for the crown between Cleopatra, supported by Caesar, and Arsinoe, supported by Ganymede and Achilles. The young Ptolemy, meanwhile, stayed as a prisoner of Caesar. He was confused by the complicated situation and didn't know what outcome to hope for. It was hard to predict whether it would be better for him if Cleopatra or Arsinoe became the successor. As the echoes of battle fade over the ancient city of Alexandria, we close chapter six with Caesar and Cleopatra standing united, their fates intertwined amidst the chaos of the Alexandrian War. But as one conflict ends, another rises, casting shadows of doubt and intrigue over their victory. In chapter seven, we'll explore the aftermath of war, the political machinations that threaten to disrupt the fragile peace, and the personal trials that test the bonds of love and loyalty. From the tragic loss of the great library to the execution of Achilles and the rise of Ganymede, the landscape of Egypt shifts under the weight of power struggles. As Cleopatra's rule is solidified with Caesar's support, the ripples of their actions extend far beyond the Nile, drawing criticism from Rome and altering the course of history. Join us as we delve into the complexities of their reign, the challenges they face, and the legacy they strive to build. The story of Cleopatra and Caesar continues, a tale of ambition, sacrifice, and the quest for eternal glory. Stay tuned, for the journey into the heart of Egypt's golden age is far from over.